All right, Miss Rachel Lavin, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic. Life is good. It's sunny outside. And we're going to talk about donut diaries here, huh? Yes, let's please. Well, let's talk about what's the inspiration for this book. Let's jump. Let's jump right in. Yeah. Just jump right in. Okay. Well, I wrote this book because for my entire first half of my life, I struggled with not only restrictive dieting, with my body, with feeling betrayed by my body, by just feeling not that I deserve to be in any space because I didn't have the right body. And I realized that I was punishing myself and I didn't need to do that anymore. So I took the steps to grow and deal with my trauma and realize that I deserve to be happy. And now I put my story in the donut diaries and I'm now hoping that I can help every woman feel whole and safe in their own body. Well, talk a little bit about the struggle that you've had with your body growing up. And I think that's, it connects with a lot of people. Talk about that. Absolutely. From the earliest memory, I can remember feeling that I didn't look like everybody else and that my body was different and I was to this, to that. And I never felt just comfortable in my own skin. And so when I started to grow up and get older and have other emotions, I always felt so reclusive because I was always thinking in the back of my mind that my body was the first thing people were going to see that was the first thing they were going to notice that I wasn't pretty enough that I wasn't you know thin enough that I didn't fit in and I just spent my whole life feeling like that and I know that there's other women that do too well there's other people that do too sure sure were there ever people in your life who contributed to this feeling of course of course but as I dealt with my trauma as I've dealt with the my past I realized that it was me putting it out in the universe you know I would tell people I know I've gained weight or I I know I'm fat or how do I look do I look fat like I was always putting that out in the universe and it, it was almost like giving people permission to talk about my body and as I recovered from the restrictive dieting and binging and, and hating my body, I, I stopped that a hundred percent. I stopped that and realized that nobody's opinion was about my body needed to be heard or ma it didn't matter. It's how I felt about myself. So what type of things did you do to help kind of stop this process or to move towards healing for it? The first thing I did was I stopped talking bad about myself mm. to myself and out in public. The second thing I did was I started allowing myself foods that I restricted from my whole life. And then I let go. The third thing was I let go of the number on the scale, like what I thought I had to be. Even being in the fitness space, being a personal trainer, I just, I let it go. And I realized that no one's opinion about me mattered as much as my own. So obviously it's been a process in going through this. I mean, no one does anything cold Turkey, generally speaking. So tell me about what that process was like working through this and how has it currently been for you? Absolutely. It was not easy in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. It was hard. There was lots of emotions. There was lots of tears. There was lots of, I have to do this by myself. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. And there were things that I told myself that I didn't quite believe in the beginning, but I decided that my happiness was more important than feeling like this temporarily. Now, I love the fact that I can get up and get out of bed and start my day and say thank you to the universe and not think about my body at all. Of course, I'm not going to lie to your listeners. Do I have my moments? Do I have my days? Of course I do. But they're few and far between. And those moments are easily dealt with in a way where it's like, that's not how you feel about yourself anymore. And those things are not true. So tell me a little bit about your work in the fitness industry and how this all wraps together. And then I want to kind of go into 
uh, weight loss and what your thoughts are about that from the past and the current aspect of things with things like Ozempic and Wigovi and all these different, these hot new drugs and things for that. So let's talk a little bit about kind of how you feel being in the fitness space and, and working through this. Okay. All right. So take me back on where you want me to start. Just start like just getting into the industry and how you felt being in the industry, but also dealing with a lot of these issues that you've had in the past and have and worked through. How did you view yourself being in the industry and how do you think others viewed you? Well, being in the fitness industry, the one thing I can honestly say is that I always had confidence in my love for the industry. I always knew I wanted to help people. I always knew that I could relate to people. But in the beginning of my career, there were definitely things that I bought into that I, I know better now. It definitely opened up for people to be critical about my body and to feel like they could talk about my body. You know, you don't look like a trainer. You should do this. So you look like a trainer. Or when I was at a place where my body was smaller, people would say, oh, you look like a trainer. So I've definitely heard it from all sides. Now that I've kind of gotten some time under my belt of how I feel about myself and how I trust my body, I definitely don't even engage in those kinds of conversations anymore. I don't hear that kind of chatter anymore. I think it's become a much broader space, the fitness industry in the past 10 years, where it's more widely accepted for men and women to not look like they're getting ready for a body competition or a fight or whatever. We're, we're all human beings and we all deserve to do and work in a career that makes us happy. So I do appreciate that. But there is that part of fitness that I'm doing my best with a bunch of other amazing people to dismantle. And that is that when people come to you, that, well, it must be for weight loss. It must, that must be your goal. You're here because you want to lose weight. And that's just the furthest thing from the truth. But there are still people with that belief system. I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, no, it was great. <laughs> there's, there's certainly a lot of people with that belief system. And where do you think that belief system comes from in your mind, especially with your experience with all of this? Well, it's unfortunately what we're taught, right? As we're getting our certifications and going through our college education, that is the one thing that we are taught, how to take people's body fat, how to create a diet for somebody, the best workout for weight loss. And that is just, unfortunately, it's the foundation to the fitness and wellness space so dismantling that because it's what you know can be difficult, but we're doing our best. Most definitely. How challenging do you think it is at this point where now we're seeing this incredible rise in, they're not specifically weight loss drugs, but their side effect is weight loss and things like Ozempic. Mm -hmm. How, what are your thoughts on that? And <clears throat> what are maybe the potential dangers of things like this? Well, my, and my thought is this is, I'm afraid. I'm afraid yeah. for people because they are literally not hearing anything other than it's going to help you lose weight. Right. And I hate to burst the bubble of people who are taking these drugs now, but we had that stuff back in the day too. It was <laughs> called Dexatrim, you know, it was called Slim Fast. They're all drugs. So true. You know, if they're just rebranded and put in a prettier package. And it's unfortunate that we are still striving for that magic pill. Yeah. We are still striving for that one thing that is going to help keep the weight off. And I will tell you, it's not my opinion. It is fact. It's science based that anytime you take a drug like that, and then you stop taking a drug, the weight comes back and nine out of 10 times, it's more than you lost. And it's not something that you can sustain. It's not a drug that you can be on the rest of your life. I just want to give Pete, your listeners a quick fun fact is that one month of Ozempic 
costs anywhere between $700 to $1,100 a month. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, of course. And it's, what's interesting is you said like Dexatrim and SlimFast. Like Dexatrim, wasn't that basically like speed? I mean, it was essentially like- Yeah, ben -ben speed. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's yes. crazy. Like humans keep falling for these things mm -hmm. on a regular, there's a, there's a interesting desperation with it, but also it's made popular by pop culture. And so talk a little bit about the influence. I know this has been very popular in say like Hollywood, the movie industry. Talk about the power of that and, and people being persuaded to take these things. It's so powerful. I mean, it's so powerful. You know, when you and I were kids and teenagers, we didn't have social media. Thank God. I, I mean, know. We did, we did, <laughs> yeah, we did have, of Ooh. course, People Magazine, and it was like whatever actress of the time and her diet and meal plan. I mean, it, so it's always existed, but it's, I just feel like kids and teenagers are inundated with it because they're on social media. And I've even watched a couple of documentaries that, you know, people are doing their Ozempic journey on TikTok. So they're wow. following these, yes, they're following these women who are on Ozempic and they're watching their progress. And because we are so fascinated with the fact that you can be 300 pounds and then you can be 115 pounds and this is how you got there. But let's talk about what else did you do? You know, they had to exercise. You know, they had to eat right. You know, they had to sleep. You know, they had to do all these things. It's not like I injected myself and then I lost 300 pounds. It's not that easy. So unfortunately, I'm afraid for our teenage girls. I'm afraid for our youth. I am I really am because this stuff is dangerous. It's not even a weight loss drug it's so you can manage your diabetes, diabetes and yes all that logic is going out the window because like you said celebrities are try are being very open and honest about what they're doing it's sad i don't have anything better to say than it's just sad what is this what is this obsession with following celebrity advice like what is that <laughs> i wish i knew i, I want to know Oh. I want to know too, because I think that if you can be someone who is in the limelight, in the spotlight, and what you say matters, it's like maybe a case of the haves and have nots. I don't know. I mean, their lifestyle from this view looks spectacular. They have cars, they have private planes, they get to go to country, different countries. I don't know if it's feeling that they want that too. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, I would love to sit down with a group of teenage girls and like <laughs> talk about it. Um, but it is something that has, from even back when I can remember, I mean, people wanted to know everything there was to know about Marilyn Monroe. And then it was, you know, Linda Carter, I'm totally dating myself. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, but, and now it's like the Kardashians. So right. I just, I'm not sure that that's going to go away. Yeah, I don't think it's going to go away. There's something deeply embedded in the people that see other people and then want to be like those other people. Mm -hmm. The facade of that, their life is better than yours mm -hmm. or that. That's a very difficult thing to break. But it feels like it's um, it's like on steroids now because it's like this concept of the every person celebrity mm -hmm. that that you're just one video from being viral mm. just one step away it's basically kind of like the lottery to me you're just <laughs> one ticket away from being a multi-millionaire and uh i've had several people on and and one guy in particular who runs uh is the director of nike youth camps and he said a lot of the kids just want to be youtubers like mm. they don't even care about the outcome of being great at their sport they just want to be a youtuber because they think that's what's important in life. Right. The celebrity of it. The it's this deep need to want to be noticed for, mm. for attention. This attention disease is incredible. I feel like that's developed. It's maybe the most dangerous thing. So that even makes me more sad because like, are we all collectively not being seen and heard that that's what we have to do? Right. 
So it's a deeper issue then, potentially of, are you being seen and heard locally in your home on a regular mm -hmm. basis? I mean, is that part of it potentially? I would have to say yes. I feel like people act out because they're not being seen and heard. So people, we have to do better with our kids. I talk to parents all the time about the conversations that they're having about their own bodies in front of their kids. Yeah. Because if you think that they don't hear that and pick up on that at home, I have to educate you and tell you that they are. They're hearing it and they're applying it to themselves. And that's why there's eight-year-old little girls saying, I'm fat and I need to be on a diet. So we really need to address this in our own homes. For sure. I think so too. It's uh, one of the hardest things. You know, I feel like as humans, we skirt the main issue. We tend to skirt the main issue and we kind of hover around the surface. Well, it's this thing, it's the schools, it's this thing, it's celebrity culture. But when you get down to it, I mean, what's your first contact in life? Or the people you grow up with, your family. It's like we're afraid to talk about poor parenting with because it almost feels like it's too personal. But it's really the, the genesis of this stuff starts at home and it just does, you know. I agree with you wholeheartedly. All right. So how do we, it's like, how do we have a positive discussion on parenting without taking people down about it and say, Hey, listen, there are obviously various factors, but what is your role and your child's participation and how they feel about themselves? And, and obviously that manifests itself as adults. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talked about your story. I mean, mm -hmm. these things live with you for a very long time if you don't confront them. They do. They literally take over your whole life. They take over how you make decisions. They take over your relationships. So I guess you are so correct about that. I don't think it's too early at this stage to have a conversation with your child about self-love, self-confidence, self-awareness. I don't think it's too early to teach your kids how to be kind to other people. Yeah. I really don't. But you have to start with you. And that's why when yeah. I talk to parents, it's like you have to deal with your trauma and your issues before you can even consider trying to help somebody with theirs. Totally I know agree. Parents, sorry. No, totally agree. There's a, a lot of times, well, you, you, there's this weird cycle, right? Because as parents, if you never dealt with yourself ever, but then you make the decision to have children, you're just perpetuating this weird cycle. It's very cruel, actually. Uh, you haven't worked on yourself, and then you just you you basically pass on all of your trauma, all of your issues, and then you don't have good coping mechanisms when your children, like children are, they act out and do different things. They're learning how to live in the world. Mm -hmm. If you haven't worked on yourself, you're essentially creating a time bomb with yourself and your offspring. With you know. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. I think that some people, even if they grow up in that environment, yeah. like myself, they get to a point where it's like, even though it took me until I was 40 years old, it's like, okay, I need to deal with this. And yeah. I need to get the help that I need so I can have my own life. And then I'm not, mm. you know, connected to my trauma anymore. I don't have to keep living my familial traumas experience anymore i get to be rachel i get to be myself yeah. and you know it was not an overnight process but i am so grateful that i was provided with the right people and the right tools to get through those things what an interesting comment i get to be rachel something there that's deep to me like Almost like you felt like I was living this life that I never got to actually be Rachel. Mm -hmm. I can Can you talk about that? There's something very profound about that. Absolutely. I think if you grow up in an environment like I did with my mom, who was, and I love her to death. My mom did the best she could with what she had at the time, but my mom has not let go of her trauma. Mm -hmm. And that became my trauma. And that's how I lived my life was living up to my mom's expectations of who I was supposed to be. 
treating other people the way I saw my mom treat other people, cutting off people who pissed me off or did yeah. I felt slighted me. And I realized that's not who I am. That's not who I want to be. And why do I do those things? And I'm going to be very honest with you. I had an amazing therapist tell me one time, you're not your mother. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> you yeah. know, and it's just, it kind of started this awakening for me. It's like, I am my own person. I am somebody who can have my own thoughts and my own relationships. And I don't have to look to her anymore. Yeah. And being able to break free of that and kind of establish boundaries, I've been able to have a lovely relationship with my mom now because there's that separation emotionally, mentally, physically, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't live in the same place as she does. I mean, it's just yeah. all of it kind of is where it needs to be now. And, and there's so many people dealing with the same exact thing you just said, you know, this almost reckoning of that you exist outside of the situation you came from. Yes. And, and, and how long that takes to recognize that, that I am Rachel and I exist outside of this. And it's, it's interesting, right? Did you need other perspectives to help break you out of that cycle? It's not just something that you can just tell yourself all the time. You know, it's other perspectives are often needed to help break a cycle. Absolutely. I just, I think that the universe answers you when you ask those questions and they provide you with the tools that I mean, not everybody will agree with this and that's okay. They don't have to. I know what I believe and what works for me and what continues to work for me. And if I bring in positivity and I put out positivity, that's what I get in my life. Yeah, well, it's it's very similar to, you know, um, whatever you grow, you're going to grow. If you're going to grow negativity, don't be surprised that you get a lot of negative things. If you sow very positive things, this isn't rocket science, man. It's <laughs> like this isn't like understanding the mechanism of hydrogen, you know, and ions, and, and this is like literally like, listen, you surround yourself with good people, positive people, or you surround yourself with very negative influences. What do you think the outcome's going to be? Mm -hmm. it's, a pretty much I linear, think people you know? are afraid of the simplicity of that though. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it feels too simple. It's like, well, it can't be, it has to be complex for me to yeah. like go through this big journey, you yeah. know, because like often a lot of things are very simple. Yeah. They actually really are. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just like a client's like the one of the biggest simple things with a client to tell is like showing up. Like mm -hmm. you show up, you've done a huge portion of the work already. Yeah. Like, just being here is like, is a huge part of the actual experience of working with someone. But it feels like there should be all these other hoops to jump through. People often make these barriers to make the journey feel worth it on some weird way, you know? Well, because we're inundated with catchphrases like you, no pain, no gain, you have to earn it. You have, you know what I mean? And I, that might be a collective belief. I'm not sure, but I think that that's why something so I, the best, the best thing I've ever heard in my entire life was the advice, let it be easy. And I was like, wow. Mm. <laughs> and it's just so powerful. Just let it be easy. Yes. Yes. Actually, I have something very similar to that. I always tell this to people like, like friendship. I said, make you should be the easy friend like make friendship make make it easy to be friends with you don't make it difficult don't show up late all the time don't not call you know call people back on time all this stuff like if you're doing all this stuff that's sabotaging your friendships you're like the difficult friend mm -hmm. just make it easy be make it make friendship easy i love um, that right it's like and when you do that people want to be around you they want to spend time with you. But if you make it hard for people to connect with you, you can't be surprised if you don't have a lot of quality friendships. <laughs> You're just making it hard. You know? Yeah. You're right. You're right. Like it's just like, but again, that seems like an oversimplification of the deal. But honestly, it really is. I find it to be very simple. I don't know. It's like show up on time, be nice, be supportive, 
validate my feelings, you know, uh, make it a two way street. It sounds really simple. Honestly. But I think it's you're so right. But it's also being honest. Like, yeah, I have had to tell a friend, I love you so much, but I am going through something and I just can't be there for you at this moment. Yeah. And but by articulating my feelings, but also, too, if I am in a space and somebody else needs me, it gets me out of that space. So yeah. there's, you know, setting healthy boundaries, but there's also being a little selfless and figuring out how to be a friend, even though you've got your own stuff going on. Right. Yeah. And, and there is a lot of complexity to things. But and sometimes when it is just obviously easy, just make it easy. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> like, don't create all these walls that don't need to be there uh, yeah. for that. So tell me real quick, I want to know, like, what was the process like writing this book? Like, how did you feel during the process and what was it like when it was done? So writing the book was super therapeutic. There was lots of things that I felt compelled to put in because I knew that I wasn't the only one who felt like that. And I really wanted my book to be super relatable. And when you got finished with it, you set it down, you would say, I'm not alone. So I wrote my book with that intention in mind. So I came from a place of uh, authenticity, I came from a place of honesty, and I came from a place of humor. Because because even though you're sharing your story, it doesn't mean that it has to be like, I was this blah, 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 and have it yeah. just be this whole river of the negative emotions. There were some funny stories in there, how I was learning my lessons, and I love that. So that was my process of writing the book. And when I, when I read it for the last time and realized that I couldn't do anything else, I knew it was done. And I love the feedback that I get from it because they're like, Rachel, it's like you are talking to me from across me and you're telling me your story. I can hear your voice. So mission accomplished. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. Well, please tell everyone how they can connect to with you and to get your book to learn more about your journey thank you well my book is called the donut diaries it's available on amazon my website and all my social media handles are under rachel lavin wellness and you can connect with me through any of those i love talking to people so if you have questions or you just want to commiserate or what is there uh, Com- commiserate yeah yes <laughs> i'm i'm happy to have a conversation with you um Yes. So please come find me. Rachel, thanks so much for spending some time with me and uh, having an enlightening conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.